computer, turn on. Load Charlotte and Kent Garden Program. Resume chapter. Isn't it lovely that Mr. Collins is in the garden today? <laughs> Virtual reality. Virtual reality is a rich, visual, multi-sensory, computer-simulated environment in which we could immerse ourselves and with which we could interact. For some time now, it's been possible to construct super realistic 3D models for us to fly around in, interact in virtual worlds, a la gaming, don head-mounted displays and haptic gloves, even walk around rooms, life-size rooms and projection spaces. In science fiction films too, They've shown us how virtual reality may play out. Academics like Janet Murray, who wrote the book Hamlet on the Holodeck, have created design frameworks to help us design virtual reality experiences. And technologists like Ivan Sutherland, who first invented the head-mounted display in 1968 at MIT, and Jaron Lanier, who founded VPL Research and indeed popularized the term virtual reality, have created the building blocks for the virtual reality industry. But despite this big headway, <laughs> the technology for many years just wasn't there yet. It was unwieldy, to say the least. It made you throw up, and it was expensive for mass consumption. Fast forward September 1, 2012. A young guy by the name of Palmer Lucky, and yes, this was in his basement, invented a head-mounted display that solves the problem of lag, virtual reality without nausea. He launches this Kickstarter campaign and raises over $2 million, way above the 250000 that he was his goal. Oculus Rift, his company was called, was then, two years later, bought by Facebook for, can anyone shout in the audience, $2 billion. Same time this year, you're going to be able to buy an Oculus Rift headset for a price point that's a little less than the iPhone 6. So many people in the interactive storytelling community have been waiting for this for a very long time, including myself. When Norman Jewison invited me to create the New Media Laboratory at the Canadian Film Center some 20 years ago, a skunk works for the creation of visual forms of storytelling, I was already dreaming about starring in my own Pride and Prejudice. Thank you, TEDx, for letting me make one. <laughs> um, but it wasn't really until recently that we started to explore forms in the virtual space, like Google Glass applications or augmented reality applications, um, companies that were accelerating. And most recently, we actually developed our first Oculus Rift experience with the company called Occupy VR, with Blair Renault and Jay Lee Williams, where we took our award-winning um, uh, interactive storytelling project called Body Mind Change, starring David Cronenberg, and stuck it in this virtual reality space. It's decidedly creepy, and it makes you feel like you're living inside this dream. So, I know that we're poised along this trajectory of creating virtual reality applications, tools, and experiences. But, as I was planning our future strategies and how we would help develop the virtual reality industry, I was struck by how, like it was 1994, I had this feeling that it was like 1994 when Netscape, the first commercial web browser, was launched. And this feeling made me pause and take stock. And so what I want to do now is extract the lessons of the internet experience of the past 20 years, because I think these lessons will help guide us in the creation of the commercial reali virtual reality industry in the next 20 years.
So let's go on to the first lesson, business model. For this, I need to use a metaphor, and it's a bit of a thought experiment, so I need your help. So I want you guys to look around you, look at the stage, look at what's in front of you. Now imagine you are in a transparent bubble. Everything looks the same as when I asked you to observe the space. Now imagine that instead of being able to see through the bubble into the stage, that an exact image of the same space is being projected onto the surface of the bubble. Again, everything looks the same. But of course, it's not the same. It's virtual reality. And this image that you're seeing displayed on the surface is a manufactured and synthetic one. And we rely on the person who's doing that displaying to send us an accurate image. Now, it's clear that in this situation, we have absolutely no idea if what we're seeing, this virtual re reality that we're experiencing, is indeed accurate or true. Now imagine that the person who's projecting this image is not only doing that, but collecting information about you, about how you're responding to this image. It would be like you being Jim Carrey in The Truman Show. Now the people on the balcony there might go, well, Anna, we've seen that movie before. But in fact, it should feel familiar, because vast areas of the internet resemble this, but in a low-tech way. The reality that we see when we look at our Facebook homepage has been carefully constructed by Facebook. The Google search results that Google displays are different for everyone. In effect, on the internet, we all see a different version of reality. Now, the reason for this is that technology is not neutral. In fact, it never has been and it never will be. The advent of the internet was supposed to bring this democratized access to rich communications and information through email and the web, etc. But instead, what we've seen that's been driving the evolution of the internet economically is the relentless focus on the internet user as consumer. Now, a good way to understand this even more clearly is to use another framework, the Moments of Truth framework popularized by Procter & Gamble. As their CEO, A.G. Laffley, once said, the moment that the consumer stands in front of a store shelf is the first moment of truth. Without that moment, there will be no second moment when the consumer consumes the products and benefits from them. Now, what happens when we insert the internet into this framework? This image that you see in some retail circles would be called the zero moment of truth, the time at which you recognize you need something and you go online and search for it. That behavior now is called Googling it. When we add social media to the mix, you have the third moment of truth, where you love a product so much that you can't help but tweet about it or post it on Facebook. So really, to go back to this business model, the business model of Google, Facebook, Pinterest, and the firms who dominate the internet today is built upon the successful manipulation of the first and third moments of truth. And they've become so good at this as they learn more and more about us, as they learn more and more about you. Now, they didn't do this overnight. What we've actually seen over the course of the last 20 years is the gradual incursion of the large providers into more and more of you sucking up data at a more and more granular level. Now, the data that I'm talking about includes, at first, search behavior, then it was instant messaging content, click-throughs, likes, location, and now, even today, since we all know we live in a post-Noden world, our own private email content. 
The effect of this is that more and more of what you do has become the basis of a microtransaction, the addition of one more data point carrying potential economic value for the large data warehouses. Leading one-time CEO Eric Schmidt to remark, technology will be so good, it will be very hard for people to watch or consume something that has not, in some sense, been tailored for them. So this brings us to lesson two. So this is where we are now, right? Now what happens when we bring VR into this situation, to life inside the bubble? Well, VR places the consumer in a tightly controlled, synthetic, trusted space in which micro-behaviors, like the way my eye moves or the way my head tilts, can be, uh, can be monitored and can be closely monitored. Now, if you add the additional element of context um, provided by wearable uh, quantified self-devices, like the Fitbit, I heard R.C. Alexander today tweet out that he's got a Fitbit in the audience, or um, the Apple iWatch, which I tried to buy um, eagerly last week, then all of a sudden, indicators of, um, of emotional state can also be closely monitored. This leads to ever more granular data collection. Imagine if Google knows if and when you're happy. Okay? So now if we go back to our earlier framework, what's, what this really tells us is that the VR experience illuminates the period prior to the zero moment of truth. A time when cognitive psychologists tell us we are uniquely out of control of any sentient decision-making capability and hence more vulnerable to manipulation. I call that the sub-zero moment of truth. The bubble knows what you want before you even want it. The last lesson I want to talk about is this. It's the network, stupid. The stupid person in that regard is actually me, because I forget this all the time. I'm a content gal, so um, even though I know that content distribution, like Netflix, is a significant part of it, the internet, and I have to remind myself this all the time, is dominated by many-to-many -many applications, like email or instant messaging, social media, etc. We know that as we move into a VR-saturated world, this will be part of that. So you may live in a VR bubble, but the good news is you won't be alone in it. The porn industry knows this very well. <laughs> so among the many virtual realities that you'll experience will be spaces in which you'll meet other people. And these are going to be glorious, wonderful, immersive spaces that you can play games in or spaces that you can um, meet for virtual rock concerts, or even spaces in business that will have a little bit more heart now that they're more immersive. The, the thing that I have to remind myself, though, is that with network use comes network effects, and some of them are good, like flash mobs and Kickstarter, and some bad. So network effects explain why so few firms dominate the internet. Network effects also explain why we all watch the same dumb BuzzFeed and upworthy videos. So to summarize, the wide open democratizing internet of the mid-1990s is now unfortunately barely recognizable. Absent any effective regulation of its economic infrastructure, the internet has become an economic engine devoted to converting big data from billions of people into large profits for a small handful of players. This commercial focus has squeezed out the pub public commons. In cyberspace, those are spaces in which people congregate 
outside of the economic interference that typically shape their behavior. So what has once been a vast expansive view has now become a constrained and homogenized one despite the fact that the internet also ushered in a golden era of peer-to-peer -peer communications. So where do we go from here? Well, I think VR is going to evolve in ways that we can't anticipate. But we don't have to repeat the errors of the past or to allow them to be amplified. As Alan Kay said, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Now, with VR, we're, we're, we're tasked with a design challenge because VR amplifies the pressures that has defined the internet as we know it today, the stuff that I've been talking about. So if we want to do something about it, we need to work at it. So I'll close very quickly now with three design goals that I think we should have. The first one is let's link payment to consumption. Free has a price. We may not want to pay that price in an internet augmented by virtual reality. The second design goal is we need to allow for an unfiltered perception of cyberspace. The pixels on my bubble are not for sale, or they are for sale, but only in my terms. And the third design goal is to restore the public commons. We need to have walled off areas that are free from economic intrusion. I think I haven't been clicking my clicker. I got so interested in my talk. <laughs> so, this is where we are now. This is my son, Neo. He's five years old, and uh, he's playing the Oculus Rift there um, on Portal 2. And yes, he was actually named Neo from the Matrix. Except my partner's French, so we thought we'd put the accent on the E. <laughs> so, in my mind, he's been living in this virtual world um, for a lot longer than before he was born. And I want him to be successful in this augmented reality he's growing up to experience. I don't want him to be some kind of unaware, exploited, unexploited participant in a hostile Matrix-style world. So, I think we have the power to shape what this world will be. And I, for one, I'm going to try to do just that. Thank you.